here you go. There's the original meme. I am a second year CSEC major. Um, I've actually almost been a web, or web dev for almost seven years. Uh, that's kind of crazy to think about. Um, I used to say uh, four for like a couple of years in a row because I didn't actually want to think about that I've been doing it for that long. Uh, do single page web apps, full stack, basically you name it. I've dabbled. Uh, I'm also the director of PR for RIT Sec. Uh, I also do some red teaming and black teaming as well. So buckle in, all right? We're gonna learn basically everything overview of web. Uh, we used to do a basic web and an advanced web presentation. Now we're just gonna speed run the entirety of web. Uh, this replay will be available on Twitch and YouTube. So go back, use that if you uh, wanna find out more. So first let's start off with um, some web basics. <clears throat> what is the web? Well, obviously the World Wide Web, that's where WWW comes from. Uh, it's an information sharing platform that operates over the internet, pretty basic. I'm sure we all know that, especially considering you're on Twitch right now watching this stream. Uh, and when you went to that stream today, you entered what's called a uniform resource locator or a URL, i.e. twitch.com or oh, wait, twitch.tv, uh, my bad. Um, but this is a, basically an easy to remember address that flags a location on the web, um, such as this example.com right here. So <clears throat> there's some technologies that we use to support the web. Um, HTTP is the primary protocol that we use to transfer content over the web. And it's how clients and servers uh, talk to one another in order to serve up your favorite content, uh, like watching me on Twitch uh, or sitting there watching TikToks for hours or Snapchatting your friends, whatever, whatever. Oh, twitch.com redirects to twitch.tv. Thank you very much. Um, then this content is actually uh, rendered and served to you usually through a combination of three different technologies. Hypertext markup language or HTML, cascading style sheets or CSS, and JavaScript, sometimes called JS. Uh, the three of these technologies are what makes up the majority of the web content uh, that exists. So HTML is used to structure web page. Uh, it could be skin considered the skeleton. Um, CSS is how we style it. Um, it's kind of like the face of the whole operation. Um, and JavaScript is used for interaction. So I guess if you were continuing on the analogy, it's like uh, the muscles of the web page. Um, there's also frameworks out there written in JavaScript now, um, such as React, Angular, Vue.js. Um, and these are used to create what's called single page web apps, which we'll get into a little bit later. So how does HTTP work? Uh, basically, uh, client and server connect via port 80 uh, if we're doing HTTP, um, but we also have this fancy uh, encrypted connection called HTTPS, which uses TLS to encrypt your uh, connection back and forth. Um, but at its core, basic TCP connection, we open that and first our client is going to send an HTTP request. So the HTTP request can be made by a browser, curl, wget, whatever. Um, but HTTP requests, they require three things. First, they require an HTTP version. Second, they require what HTTP method you're going to use. And lastly, where to send the HTTP request. Um, optionally, uh, you can also have um, headers attached to that and a potentially a body slash payload. But uh, I will explain that more in just a little bit. Next, uh, you the server will respond with an HTTP response. Uh, all that's really required here is status. Um, so if you ever see, oh, error 404, uh, page not found, there, there's your status. Uh, that 404 is that status. That's all that's required for the server to send back. Uh, there's a lot of optional stuff like uh, they can send back a body or response uh, or some cookies. 
along with that. But these just the status just is there to describe what is happening on the server side and what kind of response you're getting. And of course, this whole connection is stateless. So in between uh, multiple requests, uh, the server can't really tell the difference between a handful of requests. Each one is handled independently. So HTTP methods, um, this is a part of our request. Um, there's a whole lot of methods, as you can see on the side here. Um, and there's a lot of standards that exist around these methods. However, technically, if you control the server side of a web server, uh, you're, you're free to use them however you like, really. Um, browsers tend to stick to this table feature-wise. But when you control both sides of the application, you're kind of free. You have a little bit of freedom there. Obviously, our GET request, that's pretty common. I'm sure you've heard of it before, um, especially if you've ever used WGET. Uh, this is when you want to get a resource. The web server will go get that resource for you and return it. Um, a head request, this is when you just want the headers. It's essentially the same as get, but the server's only going to send back the headers and not any content. Um, uh, the put and post requests, those are very similar. Um, it's when you want to send data to the server, like if you're uploading a file or submitting a form. Um, typically, uh, the post request is used for creations and the put request is used for updates. Um, that's just kind of standard. Um, and just a note that you can send data along with any of these requests as long as it's not trace. Um, but the standard is that post and put are used to send data to the server. Ah, uh, yeah, no, you're right. Yeah, so you, yeah, it's a good, it's a good uh, method to limit your uh, applications to these standards. That way, you don't have any funky, uh, funky things going on. Um, the delete request, uh, it's usually used in deletion. Um, this is used in what is called CRUD operations or create, read, update, delete um, in APIs. So if you have, uh, I don't know, a user and you wanna delete that user, you would send a delete request along with some describing details about uh, who that user is that you wanna delete, and then it will delete them from the database. This, that's just typical use case here. Um, connect request, usually uh, it opens, it's used to open a connection or a tunnel to the server. Um, this is not the same as the connection header that you'll see in a lot of requests. Uh, options requests are used to get a list of supported methods from a server. So if you send an options request to an endpoint, it will let you know all the different actions that you can do on that endpoint. So uh, if we have a slash users endpoint, and we send an options request to it, it'll let us know, uh, oh, maybe you can get, and that will return all the users. We can post, you know, create a user. We can put, it'll update a user and so on. Um, trace, it is, I, I have never really seen trace used, um, but it's kind of similar to trace route as far as I understand. Um, patch, patch is not, used very often, um, but VMware tends to use it a lot um, in vSphere and NSXT. Uh, ask me about that later. Uh, but basically, it allows like a list of changes to a resource to be sent, and those will be applied. So these HTTP statuses are also standardized. Um, so anything in the 100 range uh, basically is just informational. Um, everything in the 200 range, yeah, no, successful, valid response. Uh, everything's good. Uh, 300 redirection, that means that, you know, obviously this resource has been moved and your browser often automatically handles redirects um, and it, you won't notice it. Uh, 400 uh, error, that means, I mean, you did something wrong, 404. Uh, that means you entered in a wrong URL. Uh, 500, that means that the server is messed up. Uh, this is uh, 
I mean, this is could be a multitude of things, but usually the backend devs need to go dig in and figure it out. Um, in reality, these codes can be whatever you want, um, but you typically have to stick to these standards because uh, if you don't, the browsers do a lot of automatic handling of these errors based upon which category they fall in. Um, yeah, yes. <clears throat> All right. So the HTTP headers are another part um, of the response to the submit request. So uh, essentially, headers are just metadata. Uh, there are a lot of standardized data, uh, headers, um, but you can also make up your own and submit those with your request. So if you have custom uh, headers you want to provide for your application, that's perfectly fine. You can you can send those instead of sending them and in the body of the request. Um, they have a key value syntax. Um, so similar, like you can see uh, content type uh, and the content type would be application JSON. Um, essentially, this just describes the client and server. So like what type of connect or what type of content to expect or how long is the body? Uh, what type of client is it? Um, so there's a lot of uh, mobile styles that could be applied. So whether or not to send the mobile version of a web page or not. Um, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of things you can do with headers. HTTP cookies are a very special thing that need to be paid attention to. So it's a, very, it's a special HTTP header um, just called cookie. And oftentimes there will be multiple included in there. Um, you have, it's a name equals value syntax and you can list them separating them by semicolons and put as many as you want. Um, they provide statefulness to HTTP. Uh, so this is a way to link multiple requests together. Uh, so these are stored on the client in their browser um, and they're set by the server. So a response will have the set cookie header and name equals value. And I'm pretty sure you can chain them together as well uh, with semicolons. And a lot of the server, a lot of the web server uh, software out there you find, uh, if you're programming, so things like GinRouter for Golang, uh, Flask for Python, uh, they can handle cookie setting uh, easy for you and provide you easy interfaces. So you don't really need to worry about the low level stuff. Um, there is also ways to provide camper protection. Um, and then also one note is that these cookies are dangerous if they get stolen, uh, depending on the application. Uh, you can store a whole lot of information about your user in the cookies. So if these get stolen, this is this is kind of a whole big deal. Uh, so the HTTP body is another part of the uh, request and response. This is the actual data that's being transferred back and forth. So in an HTTP request, that means that this is probably like form data or uh, something something else like uh, anything to do with interaction on the web page. Um, and then in the response, you're, you may be getting like a full HTML web page. Maybe you're sending to an API endpoint and it's sending JSON back to you, um, something like this. Uh, but basically the idea is you are following the server devs API and whatever they provide you, it will come back out in the response body. Um, another note is this is often referred to as a response payload. So if we take a look back at this HTTP methods table, uh, we can see where requests are allowed to have a body and where responses are allowed to have a body. Now, if you do provide a body in some of these requests or responses, oftentimes servers and browsers will strip them out for you. Um, so don't expect it to, to work. Um, if someone if someone can attempt it and make it work, let me know. Um, but often this was actually expanded recently. Um, things like connect and options didn't used to allow bodies, but now they are optional. Um, so this this is constantly changing, um, but. Browser, like I said, browsers may auto reject it if they're not up to date, or also if 
if it's no here, it's guaranteed that there's uh, no body coming. So <clears throat> if we look at uh, HTTP requests, again, how do we make these? So you can use your browser, first of all. Uh, browsing to a web page executes a GET request automatically. So if you just need to make a GET request to an endpoint, just go to the URL in your browser. Uh, if you wanted to have some more features, you could actually write some code. So in Python, you can use a request library. Golang has net HTTP. Uh, JavaScript has the fetch API. Uh, there's, a, there's a whole lot of stuff. Uh, you can also use the command line to execute these requests. So um, if you want to use things like curl, curl is actually a really powerful tool. It's really good to learn. It can execute all kinds of requests. Um, it, it actually goes really in depth and I cannot say that I'm an expert on it whatsoever, um, but I highly recommend you uh, start learning it. Uh, Wget, I don't, I don't use this often, um, but in it, as it says in its name, it's used to just, well, make a uh, get request. So uh, if you want a quick download a file, wget's your guy. Um, I use curl tech O, uh, but that's all right. Uh, technically, you can also use net tech. Uh, you're going to have to hand craft those uh, requests, though, and I don't have time for that. So just use curl and wget. Um, something I use a lot in uh, backend web development, especially when I'm working on those APIs, is Postman. Uh, it's an API development tool. Um, it allows you to store, categorize requests for your entire API. It allows you to essentially document uh, your entire API. So you'll never forget, oh, what's that pesky endpoint again? Uh, you can just save that. You can write documentation for it. You can script it. Um, all, these, all these kinds of things. It's a very powerful tool. Um, I believe it was pretty much the first uh, to the market, at least the biggest. There's a lot of other tools out there that try and copy it now, um, but I do think it's pretty much uh, the best out there. So highly recommend. <clears throat> so when we talk web pages, how are these made up? I know I mentioned them in the very beginning. For those of you who don't know, we're gonna do a quick brief overview <clears throat> of how this works. So uh, HTML, like I said, is the skeleton of the web page. And the, this is made up of tags. And these tags are used greater than and less than signs to surround them. Uh, you have an opening tag like this body here and the H1. And then at the end, you need a closing tag uh, designated by the forward slash. Um, this uh, operates uh, also with attributes on these tags. Um, so it's a way to uh, uniquely identify and uh, provide some data and or metadata to each tag. Um, this also feeds into CSS, which kind of acts as the skin, the face of the whole web page. Uh, you use things like selectors. So if we wanted to select our div up here, uh, we could identify it by its ID and its class in CSS. Um, and then we apply styles to it. Uh, for example, setting the background color to red. This is a lot of fun to play with, especially if you like have some time. If you just go in and inspect element, you can mess around with web pages, see how it works, see, see what changes with what. Um, highly recommend you get some experience messing around. Uh, next, we have JavaScript. Yay, everyone's favorite topic. Um, so it's a scripting language. Uh, if you didn't know, inspired by Scheme, which is dialect of Lisp. Um, it is designed to run in browser engines uh, like Chrome's V8. Um, but it also runs on the server side with Node.js, uh, also Dino. Um, but I am pretty sure both of these are just Chrome's V8 pulled out of the browser, essentially, um, such that you can now run JavaScript command line or uh, server side. Uh, but JavaScript was designed such that you can interact with the DOM and interact with the browser via APIs. That's its primary goal right here. Um, so 
you can do things like form validation. Uh, so if I want to make sure that you're actually entering in uh, a valid email or something like that, uh, I can do that validation with uh, JavaScript. Um, but you can also make things like single page web apps, like I mentioned earlier. So using things like React, Angular, um, where it's actually only one page, but you're using JavaScript to modify the content of that page. Uh, you can also interact with the browser via APIs. So things like the Fetch API can be used to make uh, HTTP requests um, to different places. It replaces the old XHR requests. Um, things like the notification APIs. This is how you get those pesky notifications from all the websites that ask you, hey, can we send you notifications like Gmail? Um, there's also even a geolocation API. So you can geolocate your users. Um, there's a whole bunch of these. I recommend you go browse the uh, Mozilla Developer Network uh, or MDN. Uh, they document these very well. Um, they are some of the best documentation out there for web content. And never forget W3 schools as well. Ah, course. So the TLDR is course. It's great for security, right? But uh, sometimes it can be the complete bane of my existence. Uh, it is frustrating when it doesn't work and it's nice when it does. So essentially cores is used to check the safety of any request that's considered pre-flighted. So <clears throat> it, it basically allows you to tell the browser and the client where a request is allowed to originate from. So we can split requests into two categories, simple requests and pre-flighted requests. Simple requests require absolutely no course check whatsoever. So if we're sending things, data types like uh, a URL encoded form, uh, form, straight form data or plain text to a server, this doesn't require a course check. It's assumed that I guess you can't do malicious things. I don't know. This is all highly dependent on the web server. Um, so do a lot, do, do your own research with your own applications. But pre-flight requests, these do require uh, a course checks. So your browser will automatically send an options HTTP request before it continues doing anything that might touch course. Um, it needs two headers, access control request method and access control request headers. Um, I didn't put these on the slides because it's really not that important. Just thought I'd mention it. Um, this is something that happens, like I said, in the background automatically in your browser. Uh, there's no reason to ever manually mess with it uh, until it breaks. So things can get dicey when you try and authenticate and cores is not working properly. So the pre-flight will ask the server if it's allowed to send credentials uh, when you try and use an authorization header to authenticate. We'll talk about that later as well. Um, but just the, I think the thing to take away here is just uh, do a lot of research on cores. And I have some recommendations that I'll bring up later uh, that to make your life a little bit easier. Uh, now we're gonna move into some web vulnerabilities and their corresponding mitigations. So, Let's start with the big elephant in the room, JavaScript. Uh, don't rely on JavaScript as security. People use it as security all the time. JavaScript is not security. Please uh, don't think it is. Um, JavaScript can be modified by clients in the browser. Please do your server-side validations, all right? Uh, Cross-site scripting or XSS is a big topic. Um, to do in JavaScript. Uh, to base, break it down very basically, uh, there's three main different types, stored, reflected, and DOM. Um, stored is essentially where a malicious script is stored on the server and then executed whenever a page is load. Reflected is when malicious script is 
in like the request parameters such that when you click on a link, it will execute some script because of that specific link, not just on the page in general. Um, that's a lot harder to track down because um, you have to get a hold of the actual link. Uh, and then DOM, it's kind of complicated, way harder, but malicious script is executed because uh, you manipulated the DOM in such a way. Uh, more complicated. I don't 100% understand it. Highly recommend you do your own research. Um, but if you do get uh, XSS, it's kind of uh, GG. You can grab your cookies, go run and impersonate all your users, go for it. Um, another thing with JavaScript, client side off. Super, please, please, please never do this because I'm gonna just go yoink your password and uh, break your app. Uh, I will personally do it. If you if you do client side auth, I will personally hunt down your app and go uh, log in as admin and break everything. Um, yeah, people who can see your source code, so it's it's sent to the it's sent to the uh, client, and no, your obfuscation doesn't count as security. Uh, also, outdated npm packages when you're using. Uh, uh, when you're using single page web apps like React, Angular, uh, you're gonna be using a lot of NPM packages. Make sure you update that stuff, all right? There is security vulnerabilities that are released all the time. That's why they release patches to these libraries. Yeah, no, don't allow your clients to authenticate themselves. You need to have some say, please. <clears throat> yeah, basic mitigations, all right? Simplest vulnerability is really just when developers use JavaScript as security. So don't, it's not security. Do your validations on the server side. And also use JavaScript for its intended purposes. Don't, don't, don't try and go beyond that. Just have some fun, mess around with the DOM, make your web page fancy and interactive. Maybe do some browser things, send some notifications. Uh, do some geolocation, send some fetch requests, uh, that all that kind of stuff. Ah, cores. So there's some things that get fun with, especially with cross-site scripting, uh, when uh, cores is allowed from anywhere. This is something that happens a lot. I am guilty of it uh, during development. Uh, when you don't want to deal with it, you just disable it. So on your server, you just set your access control allow origin, which should normally be a list of allowed URLs, um, but you can also just set it, set it to star. And this will just allow everyone to make requests to your API. So this is dangerous, please don't do that. Um, also, sometimes when you don't know how many subdomains you're gonna need, or you're supporting a large, uh, or you're supporting a large organization, uh, people just allow partially validated domains to attempt to allow all subdomains. So they'll allow like star example.com. But if I want to be malicious, I can also create a website attacker example.com. And that's also a valid URL for that. So please don't do that. Be smart. Just it's not a lot of work. Uh, also, bad requests from a valid origin. So if you can find a way, cross-site scripting, to start sending malicious requests from a valid origin, whether it be partially validated or if they allow all, or they have it properly set up, then uh, GG. Uh, yeah, basically, course, uh, if you want to do it smart, just, just don't be lazy, all right? like. Enter in all your subdomains, restrict it properly, spend some time to read up on it. Uh, it's it's important. It's a really good security feature. Uh, don't sleep on it, all right? Uh, there's a lot of packages that make this very easy for you. Uh, Python has Flask cores, Golang has RS cores, Node.js just has cores. Um, there's a lot of pre-built stuff. Just, just use it. Don't be lazy. It's not that hard. So CSRF or cross-site request forgery, this uh, kind of gets a little bit complicated. Uh, 
But the essential, essentially the idea is our goal is to impersonate a user. So we are going to set up a malicious page that is now going to send requests to a vulnerable page. Uh, maybe their cores is not set up properly, for example. So if this vulnerable web page, for example, this is a very basic example, allows us to change our password by sending a post request to example.com slash password, and then we provide it a new password in the URL parameters. Um, obviously we have to be signed in. We have a cookie set with our session ID um, and everything so that way if I'm trying to change someone's password, it's not gonna work, I don't have their session. But I can set up this malicious page that will now send a request to this web page, um, maybe just via JS Fetch API, uh, like I said, or maybe like I in the DOM, I include this as an image source uh, URL. Well, when the brow or when the client loads this malicious web page in their browser, their browser has their session cookie in it. So when I make the request to example.com, I'm automatically sending my session cookie. And now my password, my password has been changed to hacked uh, because it's a valid request from a valid client who's logged in. Um, yeah, so browsers do this because you don't want to have to sit there and specify exactly what cookies you want to send every time. So cookies have URLs attached to them that they get automatically sent when requests are made to. So it's a fancy feature that can be abused. So you can try and uh, impersonate a user. Uh, to mitigate this, um, luckily uh, CSRF is actually really tricky to pull off in the wild. Um, if someone has an example of where it's really easy in the wild, uh, please let me know, because I'd love to read up on it. Um, but be smart, use CSRF tokens. This is something that a lot of web apps, uh, yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> please be smart, use CSRF tokens. A lot of web apps have this automatically built in. Essentially, it's a random ser randomized server-generated token it can get included in form data uh, or used in all your requests. Usually it's placed in a small HTML tag in the head of the page, um, like stored in the DOM or stored in local storage somewhere, something like that. Um, but yeah, read up. I also recommend reading up on this. Make sure you understand it before you try and either avoid it or implement it. Uh, Next, let's talk about authentication. Uh, so there's a lot of ways to authenticate. Uh, and I've done a lot of different authentication way methods <coughs> over, the, over my years as a web dev. Um, I started out, I was very lazy. Um, if I wanted to make a bait, my first basic web app did client side off. And yes, when you're learning, it's fine, um, but never do this in production, all right? The password, it's in the JavaScript somewhere. It, it, no matter how much obfuscation you do, your password is in the JavaScript somewhere. So if, if, if I want it bad enough, I can sit there and I can go dig it out. Um, but yeah, this is, this is dumb. Your password is now on every single client uh, machine out there. Uh, using HTTP parameters for authentication, cool, great. But what if I sniff your web traffic? Now I see you're making a post request to log in with your username and password right there. No, don't do that, please. Um, authorization headers. This is actually a valid method of authenticating. I put it on the vulnerabilities side because I do remember, and sadly I could not find the resource for today, but I do remember seeing a uh, exploitation technique that grabs this authorization header. Um, and because the authorization header is just username colon your password, and then it's base 64 encoded. Um, that's a typical method. Um, there are more secure ways to use the authorization header. Um, but I did see a way where you can grab this and then 
boom, you got login creds. Um, it's a lot better than the others, but still not recommended. I do have a better way. So use sessions. Session-based authentication is top tier, all right? You can use uh, a secure post, uh, post method. So obviously make sure you're using HTTPS. That's a given. Um, but when you send your post method, send your login information in the body. Make sure it's encrypted. Please, thank you. Um, sessions, they should be assigned tokens, which are just randomly generated. The server should store these in a database somewhere. Um, they should be sent to the client when they log in. That way they can be cached on the client's browser. Uh, sessions should also expire. They need to expire often to lower the time that if a valid session token is stolen, it has less time to be valid for, uh, giving the attacker less time to do something malicious. Um, for example, these could expire every 15 minutes. Um, but to make it so that the entire web dev experience doesn't suck, uh, because, or the web UI experience. Basically, if the sessions expire every 15 minutes and it logs me out, that's gonna suck. I don't like logging back in every 15 minutes. So sessions should also be renewable. Uh, this can happen automatically in the background. Uh, so maybe you're checking your session using JavaScript every uh, 10 minutes and we're re refreshing the uh, token. Um, this is often also accomplished by a secondary token called a refresh token. I know Google does this. Um, so you would, every time you submit a Google API request, if it comes back saying your session has expired, you can just send your refresh token to a special, a special endpoint and it will make your token valid for longer. And I believe they may actually give you a brand new token that you need to use. Um, but Google APIs are complicated. But this is a pretty uh, strong method of authentication and then further authorization during uh, web app use. This is uh, pretty standard. I think a lot of, a lot of web servers and uh, web stacks uh, support this 100%. SQL injection, this is a big topic that you hear a lot. If you have ever done a CTF, there is more than likely a SQL injection challenge in there. Um, basically, web apps, they gotta have databases. How else do we store all the data? So SQL injections happen when we abuse the web app to execute uh, malicious or bad queries. Uh, this happens mostly because of bad input sanitization. So I provided a little bit of an example here. This is PHP. So if we have a login form, um, I did shorten this, so ignore the fact that there's no username check here. But if we have a login form where we're trying to validate the password, we're going to grab our user and check if password equals, and then the password they entered. Um, but what happens if I go in the password field and type in uh, a closing colon and or one equals one? Um, well, I can show you. So as we see, the query is the same up until we get to password, where now password is just a blank string. And then we say where password is nothing or one equals one, which is true. And then we include this semicolon and a hashtag to uh, basically comment out the rest of the query if there is something beyond that. So this is just a authentication bypass. It'll just log us in, maybe give us a session token. Um, but this one, one equals one is always true. So it'll let us it assumes we have the correct password 100% of the time. So to mitigate this, all right, sanitize your inputs, always. Validate everything. Please always check that you have validation uh, or that you have valid inputs. All data coming from the user should always assume to be malicious. 
All right. Assume that every in oh whoops I accidentally messed up. Uh, always assume that inputs are going to contain bad data at some point. All right. Um, also, don't use parameters directly in queries. Provide some interface for yourself. All right. Um, you can also use prepared statements. This is uh, something fancy. Uh, it essentially turns your queries into function calls. There's a lot of escaping that happens automatically. You could also just use a database abstraction layer. So this is something uh, that abstracts your database operations into whatever programming language you're using. Uh, oftentimes these database abstraction layers do a lot of sanitization for you, it takes a lot of the work out of it. Um, it just makes things nice and easy. Um, and it's really easy to use as well, especially if you don't want to have to sit there and write SQL queries or whatever else uh, database you're using. Local file inclusion. Now this is pretty cool, actually. Um, this is when we can coax a web server to serve unintended files, like if we want to grab Etsy password. Uh, this is also helpful if we want to get remote code execution on a server um, that has a web server. So for example, if we have a vulnerable host and it's using a URL parameter to tell the server which web page we want to load. So in this case, we want to load example.html. Uh, well, what happens if we just change this to the relative path to Etsy password? Well, turns out it'll actually just give you Etsy password most of the time. Um, there is some web servers that will do a lot of validation for you, but uh, a lot of times you can get into some pretty spicy, uh, spicy files if it's not set up properly. Some ways to mitigate this. Huh, wow, deja vu. Sanitize your inputs, all right? Sanitize your inputs. Escape those characters. Don't allow them to uh, traverse your directories, all right? Secondly, restrict the web server file system access. Don't run your file server as root, all right? I'm gonna repeat that. Don't run your file server as root, okay? So, you got that? Don't run your file server as root, got it. All right, only allow uh, a user slash group uh, running as to access files uh, that we're supposed to serve, all right? So Apache has www.data, um, it's only allowed to access the var, what is it, var HTML www directory. Um, basically, restrict, restrict your web server's access to the file system only to only files that it's supposed to be serving. Um, this is very easy. Just give it access to a single directory, no other permissions. Maybe you can do some fancy SE Linux things, but uh, it's, it's very simple to do. It's very simple to do. There's no reason to make it hard. Um, also, just don't allow people to specify arbitrary files, all right? There's no reason we should be allowing our users to tell, the, tell us which HTML page they need to see. It's our application, all right? Make the endpoints that you need. Slash home should give you the home HTML automatically. Don't allow them to tell us that they need the home HTML file. Ooh, command injection is pretty fun. Uh, some people like to do some really lazy stuff, especially in JavaScript and Python and all this kind of stuff. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of different uh, things that are vulnerable to the command injection. So if we have an endpoint, with some arbitrary input, like bob underscore resume dot txt. So, huh, all right, well, when we go to this endpoint, it sends us back Bob's resume. Well, turns out if we look at the back end, it uses a vulnerable execution method because it's in Python, this is a, probably a Flask server, and it just returns os.system and cats out the file. So it just runs the cat command and pipes the output to you. Well, hey, this is this sounds kind of dangerous, right? Yeah, actually it is. So we can just abuse this 
uh, we can set the file equal to whatever can be whatever. Um, but in bash, if we just enter a semicolon, then we can start typing whatever commands we want. So this will execute cat and then also literally anything else we want. So this is fun. Um, don't do that. Sanitize your inputs. This is like repetition for everything. Sanitize, please. Literally, this is the law of the web, all right? Also, just don't run native commands from your code. We get fancy OS interfaces uh, in our languages for a reason. Use them. Don't just think, oh yeah, now, now I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna execute commands because I, I I know my way around. Ah, just just use the pre-built ones for a reason. There's been a lot of thought that went into them. Also, huh, also deja vu. Don't run as root, please. If command injection does happen, let's not make it worth their while. Minimize the impact. Make sure that they can't access much. Uh, give them little to no access, even if they get code execution. All right. All right. So now moving into, ah, uh, yes. All right, Bob. You can, uh, hi, Bob Sr. Uh, you can uh, run your web server as root. I give you permission. Just send me the URL though. All right, so we're moving into the last section of this presentation where we browse some uh, tools and techniques. So web shells are very nice. Um, they're, they're a use for post-exploitation. Um, you get access to be able to upload some files and then you can execute those files server side Web shells are very nice to execute, especially when you have PHP applications um, or things like that, things of that nature. Um, they provide a good method of persistence because uh, it's just the link you have to go to to spin it back up. Um, so, and from that, you can further install malware, um, continue to infect the host. Um, good news is there's lots of pre-made ones. You don't have to do all the legwork. Um, Kali has a bunch of them built in. I think they're in user share shells or web shells. Um, I'm not entirely sure. Um, but if you just quickly Google it, you'll find the file path. Um, there's, they, they, they're for all kinds of languages. There's this blog that I keep going back to. Uh, it's a cheat sheet for reverse shells for basically every kind of language. Um, so depending on the server type you're interacting with, use, use it wisely. So when we're trying to analyze the web app. Um, there's a handful of tools that are pretty standard. Um, Burp Suite, uh, it's pretty widely used. I think it comes pre-installed on Kali. Uh, not sure if it still does or not. Um, there is a free version, but it's typically paid for license to get the enterprise license and unlock all the features. Um, it's basically an all-in-one tool for anything web uh, testing, web pen testing. Uh, Zap is, uh, OWASP Zap is the open source version of Burp. It's written in Java. It's, it's very similar from what I understand. I've never actually used it. Um, I've only used the very basics of Burp, but from what I understand, it's an open source uh, version that's very similar. Uh, yeah, AT says Zap is cool. Um, oh, Recon NG, this is pretty cool, open source. Um, written in Python, uh, it has an interface and that's kind of like Metasploit. Um, so if you're familiar with Metasploit, it is actually pretty easy to start using Recon NG. Uh, it's a fully featured web or composites framework. It's the whole idea so it's similar to Metasploit being the exploitation framework, um, but it's mainly for web or composites. Uh, Man in the middle proxy uh, is also written in Python, also open source. Um, this allows you to intercept, inspect, modify, replay traffic. Um, a lot of similar basic things like burp and zap include, um, but this does have a command line interface and a web interface um, as well. But uh, wait, do we, do we really need all these fancy tools? No, we don't. Our browsers include some pretty, uh, pretty fancy tools built right in. Uh, if you've ever right-clicked on a page and hit inspect element, uh, well, 
uh, you've seen this window. This is the developer console or developer window. Um, it's a whole lot of things you can do. You can run some JavaScript in their JavaScript console, uh, look at source code. Uh, you can, and I say almost here because there's such things as server-side rendering. So some content gets pre-rendered server-side and you can't see the source code before that. But uh, you can see all network requests that have been made since you've opened it. You can browse the application cookies, you can browse local storage, TL, get the TLS certificates. You can do so much with the developer window. I highly encourage you to play around, uh, just kind of see what you can find. Um, you can find a lot of interesting stuff. Um, I know I found a lot of random like comments from developers in their source code so much. Um, yeah, people don't minimize their source code sometimes uh, when they go to production, which is kind of cringe. Also, another uh, another technique, uh, robots.txt exists, all right? So obviously there are web crawlers, like Google has one, um, I think Microsoft has one, like for Bing. Uh, I think a there, there's a bunch out there, right? The web crawlers are constantly going, they're just going to every single web page that they can get their hands on. Um, but robots.txt is placed at the root of your website and it's used to tell web crawlers what they should and shouldn't crawl on your web page. Um, not all web crawlers are required to follow this. Uh, like they physically can go crawl the rest of, rest of your website, but because of this, this is a great recon tool because you can go see uh, what the developers don't want the web crawlers to be looking at. Because ideally, if they don't want the web crawlers looking at it, they don't want it showing up on Google. Um, so more than likely it's something eh, decently sensitive. Not all the time though, uh, but you can find some pretty cool stuff like Nike, they have just crawl it on there, it's funny. Um, so some analysis tricks uh, to look at when you're first faced with a web app. Check for input sanitizing and mistakes. I said it like a billion times during this presentation. Go look at the source code, play around with inputs, see what you can type where and where you shouldn't. Try and break things. Hey, maybe you have to modify some things on your client, uh, but if you can modify them on your client, more than likely the server isn't gonna care and it's gonna let you send it anyways. So uh, enter things like null bytes, uh, CRLF, uh, mess around with URL encoding, uh, all this kind of stuff. Another thing is recon. It's very important. Uh, know what you're dealing with. Uh, try and figure out what server you're interacting with, look at the user agent headers, all this kind of stuff. Um, know the technologies involved. Are they using React, Angular? Are they just using plain HTML and JS? Is it a Flask app? All this kind of stuff you need to ask and find answers to those questions. Um, also, figure out all the APIs, all right? You need to go go browse the API. See if, see if they have some open API uh, documentation. Um, there is some specs that get provided often and are posted publicly for third-party apps to be able to interact with a developer's API. Go poke around, see what you can find, see what endpoints you can hit. Um, have some fun with it. And then lastly, just jump into code. Uh, automating your exploit kind of goaded, make your life easy, all right? Um, and honestly, most of this stuff is much easier done from code anyways. So just start messing around, start writing some code, and this way you kind of already automate it along the way. All right, that has concluded uh, the entirety of basic and advanced web in one presentation. I know I went decently fast. I probably missed some things. So I would love to uh, discuss with you guys in Twitch chat and Discord later. I appreciate it. Thank you.